Hey everyone, if you're a fan of the show, please head over to MikeyOp.com and click the subscribe button. It's the best way to support us, and it's free. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P dot com. Thanks! Hi, I'm Mike Oppenheim, and you are listening to Coffin Talk, Interviews with the Living, a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life. This week, coming to us from New York City is Joshua James, Joshua is a self-proclaimed weary scholar from Buffalo, New York originally, who found himself teaching in the classroom after years of working and traveling abroad. Uh, He's also into documenting the life of people in the city and I guess life in general through photography and videography. So there's tons of fun links uh, to find his stuff when you listen to the podcast. But in the meantime, let's hear from Joshua. Hi, Joshua. How's it going? Hi, good afternoon. How's it going with you? Uh, Very good. Thanks. Um, I'm excited, and as I told you in the little pre-interview, um, you're from Buffalo, and one of my best friends ever is from there. So, actually, listen, I think I've I've heard a few episodes, and one of the uh, gentlemen was from Dunkirk, actually, which uh, res- resonated with me, actually. So I was like, yeah, there's a local guy right there. <laughs> that is him. <laughs> yeah, um, and that was actually I think our second podcast ever. So uh, the first three questions I always ask my guests is, how old are you? Where did you grow up? Which we kind of covered. And uh, what generation do you consider yourself a member of, if any? Sure. Uh, I am uh, going to be exiting my mid-30s and entering my, my late 30s uh, in a few months. So I'll be 35 going on to 36 um, from upstate Buffalo, New York area, as uh, you mentioned before. Um, and as far as uh, what generation I would classify myself, I know there's a lot of different ways to uh, sort of segment it. I would say geriatric millennial maybe like i'm still probably in that uh very early fresh group um so but you know i grew you know my older sister's generation x and so i feel like there's maybe walking the line there a little bit that's a good answer and i'm familiar with that so yeah um and i guess kind of because it's in your bio and i'm always interested you said you traveled traveled abroad a lot um what's like one of your favorite countries you've been to oh man i've uh i've been to quite a few um I lived abroad in, in Germany for a few years, uh, certainly not the most ex- exciting place, but um, definitely one of the most livable places. I really, really enjoyed it there. Um, but uh, I've been fortunate to go to, um, you know, kind of far off places like Mongolia and stuff like that. And uh, driven a rickshaw across like India. So a mix of like, you know, typical touristy places and off, off the beaten path a little bit. That's awesome. And uh, our mutual connection is my brother, Sam, and I can totally see why you guys are friends now. So that's cool. Um, and, and I brought it up because this show is about what we think about death and how it affects the way we live. And so I figure if you've traveled that much, which you obviously have, you've probably interacted with other cultures and death and stuff. So I'm kind of going to leave the question hanging in the air. Um, either what do you think about death or what do you personally think happens when you die? Um, well, I mean, I've, you know, I, I've, I think I've, um gone through like high peaks of interest and then other times where i don't think about it at all i can really um intently focus on it and sometimes i try not to think about it at all but i think for me um just in general um i was always fairly aware of the concept of death and like i I lost my uh, maternal grandparents when i was fairly young um but the kind of the gravity of the situation was was still very uh you know resounded on me um it wasn't just like oh they're not here but I think I understood how it affected the family and, and was able to observe that. Both of my parents are uh, psychologists and counselors, so there's a lot of talking through your feelings and working through everything that I've had to do from a very young age. So I think processing those types of emotions uh, has uh, been um, probably a good and bad thing over my adolescence, but um, has really kind of uh, honed in my, you know, I guess, familiarity with what death is. Um, and then as far as, you know, growing up, um, yeah, there's just times where it's it's been part of my life, um, where I've had some instances with my family, um, some, you know, uh, um, with, with, you know, close family members passing away unexpectedly. Um, and then there's times where it's really good, where, you know, everything is good for a few years and then something happens that makes you think, you know, it gives you a lot of uh, brevity to the situation. For me, um, I probably tend to lean more on kind of the scientific, rational explanation that, you know, we're, you know, we're pieces of energy that once our body, which is just a vessel, goes away, that our, you know, we kind of just go into the world, into the universe. Um, But like you said, kind of traveling and and, uh, I do like to document things through, you know, visual arts, meeting people and talking with people. 
I think there's a lot of really cool interpretations and ideas about what could possibly lie, you know, uh, ahead of us and whatever happens after death. Um, and I kind of like that. I, there's not one particular thing that I prescribe to. Um, and I think that kind of what makes the whole concept of the afterlife sort of unique is you could say that you're reincarnated into something or, you know, you kind of get to look back on your whole life or, um, you know, your energy or soul or whatever you want to call it, that's sort of observing things happening as they continue on without you or, or again, you just go into, you go into the earth and that's it. So I think that um, for me, it's hard to choose one because I find them all pretty interesting, but I think it helps me value the time that I'm here actually a lot more. So um, that's one of the things I think that I get out about thinking the afterlife is that um, it could be any number of things that we just, you know, scientists or philosophers or you know even on the religious community i don't think anybody truly knows but it's one of those things where you um you know you kind of paint this picture and see what happens but in the meantime it's like live live your life uh, accordingly i think and so that's that's perfect because that was going to be my next question is your answer was i you know i tend to go with a scientific rational explanation where pieces of energy and you said however you leave room for and even at times almost kind of hope that it's something a little different so how does that boil down then when you say like live your life the way you need to and stuff, what would you tell someone who has morals that don't and ethics that don't match yours? Like someone who thinks it's okay to do something that you think is absolutely wrong to do. Do you have any like higher ground to speak on or is that just a gut feeling? Yeah, I think it. Um, I mean, I, I certainly think there are, are different lines. I mean, certainly from uh, you know, an ethical and moral standpoint there, are, I think um just lines that are out there because you know as we're here on earth whether you're you know from one place or another like we're all sort of interconnected whether people want to prescribe to that or not so i think ethically it's important to you know do good things and uh, pay it forward and things like that more so not because it pays off at some point later but it's just you know we function as a group here so um you know those things i think are inherently based on something else maybe besides you know passing away or the afterlife but i think otherwise um I'm kind of in the camp that if it's um, something that brings you happiness um, that falls in line with those things where you're, you know, not crossing maybe ethical lines or things like that. Um, I think that's, that's what you should get out of life really, because um, again, like I said, in the first question, um, there is no definitive amount of time that you hear if it happens, you know, quicker for some people than others. And uh, I think it's important that um, you try to enjoy some of those experiences while you can. Great answer. Thank you. Um... I really like the way you talk and think, and so I'm excited to uh, get as much out of you as I can with our remaining time. That's probably the last five years with your brother has probably, you know, <laughs> they got me into that line of thought. Probably that's awesome. Um, I mean, he'll listen to this, so he'll. I don't have to tell him you said that. Um, but uh, as far as like your and you and my brother are both teachers, so what age uh, group do you teach? And then once you answer that, can you uh, tell me what it's like? to watch children misbehave. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I teach um, I teach six through 12 at some point in the last, uh, I'm, I'm a fairly new teacher too. I came to teaching after a, a different career. Um, and I, so I've taught the last uh, five years uh, in a combined middle school, high school. So when I first started and when I taught with your brother, um, who I still teach with, we were teaching both like sixth grade, which are 10, 10 year olds, 11 year olds, like still very young kids. Um, and then I also teach, you know, high school students that are 16, 17, 18 year olds, you know, juniors and seniors. So even between those two age groups, there's there's such a difference. Um, and I think at the younger level, like there's there's just a lot of, you know, innocence and sort of like they're kind of just really in their true form. I think that they haven't really they may have been exposed to other parts of the world or other ideas and things like that. But I think they're at their truest self. Uh, at that, there's really kind of this wholesome quality um, to those kids. Not that the older kids are, uh, you know, not wholesome and things like that. But I think at that point, they're, you know, sort of kind of um, soaking up some of the realities that uh, the, that are kind of looming in front of them because uh, they're, you know, getting out of the sort of system, the structure of school and thinking about things that are lying ahead of them. Um, so it's really interesting when I get to teach both of them like in the same day and I teach one class to 10, 11 year olds and then I go to interact with 17, 18 year olds. It's, 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 it keeps me on my toes a little bit, which I, I kind of do like that. Uh, but now I pretty much teach um, high school seniors that are sort of going out into the world or to college or something like that. Um, as far as far as kids misbehaving, um, 
yeah, I think um, I think it's just all really relatable stuff to my just my own high school experience. Um, and thinking about just, I, I think it keeps me, um, you know, in tune to some of my maybe fonder memories or things that I had forgotten about, you know, doing as a kid. Like just, like I said, with the with the middle schoolers, just sort of just enjoying being a kid, like, you know, maybe running through the hallways or banging on a locker or something like that. Like pretty, pretty innocent stuff. Now as a teacher, it's kind of like, oh, you got to crack down on that. But like, it's, it's kids being kids. Um, and then, you know, uh, if I'm leaving work and I, you know, it's a couple of kids that are seniors, like hanging out in the park or skateboarding or things like that. It's just kind of those, you know, very simple interactions and, you know, times that you'd spent with your friends that maybe you never really thought about uh, at the time, but just like those are, those are those, I think, really kind of just wholesome moments uh, that we have uh, as adolescents. So um, I enjoy watching it, really. I, I'm probably one of the more lax teachers at the school, which is either a good thing or a bad thing. But um, I, t I, t I tend to be in the mindset of, you know, sort of let kids be kids. That's cool. That's really cool. And um, uh, because you mentioned it, it's probably going to be fascinating. What was your previous career before teaching? Uh, so I'm, this is uh, teaching is kind of my, my, my third iteration. Um, I went to undergrad for uh, a program called uh, Diplomacy and International Relations here in New York, um, and kind of you know one of those kids in high school that was uh, I was sort of like really impacted by like nine eleven and stuff like that, and I really wanted to like know more about like just international stuff and why the world was getting kind of crazy or why it was crazy at that point. And maybe it's gotten crazier now, I'm sure, but. So I wanted to be here in New York, and I wanted to do you know kind of cross cultural programs and studying abroad and things like that, and um that's what i did in school and then uh, i ended up getting a government position working for a government agency for a couple of years um and that was you know from from what i can say was like pretty interesting um at times but also was fairly monotonous like working in a big nondescript office building sitting behind a, behind a computer like you know eight nine hours a day um and then from there i just uh i went home uh, for a weekend i think um and I was just kind of a little bit of burnt out being in New York and and I came back and uh, was just visiting with my parents. And uh, like I said, I'm from Buffalo and there was a job opening at one of the local colleges up there to work in the university. And I said, sure, I love college. It was one of my best experiences. And I you know, really believe in the experience of college and learning and things like that. And so I got into that and ultimately that kind of parlayed into uh, uh, recruitment and working abroad with international students and bringing them to the U.S. to study in programs at a bunch of different universities that I worked through over, you know, five or six years. And then um, the longer I got into that, the more you kind of climb the corporate ladder and I uh, got away from working with students and families. And I was like, hey, maybe I'm better suited to work like right at the core of education, which is, you know, students in the classroom. And I think I was, uh, riding the subway one day here in new york and uh saw an advertisement for a, a kind of a teacher certification program which i think your brother did actually and um signed up and then really honestly probably the best decision i've made that's awesome and actually i would love to take a moment and freeze frame that moment in your life um a lot of guests on this show talk about intuition and even atheists like and you did not call yourself an atheist for the record but i'm just saying even an atheist has said that they believe like you know, sometimes these things just happen and they seem beyond what you call the scientific rational explanation. So I'm curious, did that moment feel special at the time when you're on the subway or is it only in retrospect? No, I think I, I think it, I think it was special in time. I think, you know, as much as I'm very pragmatic and, you know, like, you know, again, looking at rational reasoning, things like that, I think that life sort of does work out in certain ways based on you know the environmental surroundings and the relationships you have so my my the a lot of my family members are educators and my you know siblings are educators and uh aunts and uncles and things like that and i remember just again i was sort of at a point in my job where um you know recruiting internationally i was probably on the road for you know um anywhere between like 12 and 20 weeks a year and it just came you know got pretty tiring living like out of you know hotels and things like that and uh, I was down here for a meeting and it's just kind of like, yeah, like maybe this is, you know, something that I've just been kind of, you know, uh, around my entire life from, a, you know, seeing my, you know, family members go into this job field and realizing, realizing that it was, you know, I think I had a combination of sort of skills and experience that would, 
you know, make it something worthwhile. And, uh, you know, I think it was one of those points in your life where it's like, you maybe feel like you're in a little bit of a rut. So you're willing to take those risks and you're thinking, you know, eh, why, you know, why the hell not? I'll do it. And, um, yeah, I was definitely, I distinctly always remember, you know, sort of, uh, resigning from my job and like really just kind of going all in and like figuring out like, man, like, am I getting out of, you know, getting out of my element and it's definitely a huge learning curve and just, you know, quick, P, you know, shout out to teachers. It's it's probably one of the hardest jobs out there, but um, it's also one of the most rewarding. So I'm, I'm really glad I did it. That's cool. Yeah. I taught for nine years and I feel exactly the same and I can't go back only because of how nice my current career is, but I, uh, I do agree. And I do think it's important, like, cause people talk about teachers. So like esoterically, sometimes I feel like, you know, like, Oh, they're this or, Oh, they're that. But you know, the just day to day of being around like children and kids and trying to like deal with a hundred different energy streams is just, in my opinion, incredibly difficult. So, uh, that's, that's cool. Um, so kind of circling back to some of the other statements you made, something I wrote a note to ask you, because I thought your answer would be pretty interesting. Um, first of all, I, I mentioned at the beginning, but you are a great follow on Twitter. Like you really do have uh, like some unique insight and wisdom, and I'm, I'm excited to see more of your art and photography. But um, how can you explain art? And I know that's, that's the stupidest question you ever heard, so let me just <laughs> articulate it a little further. Um, as a scientific rational person who's pragmatic, but who also is like clearly open to signs and open to other things. What is art for you? Like how, how do you think that happened in this bioevolutionary process? It seems kind of mysterious to me. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, you could, you could do a whole show or a series on that. Um, I think that, um, you know, I, uh, the best way to look at it, I guess, is that it's, it's, the, the easiest and like not not interesting answer is that it's it's open to interpretation. But that being said, I mean it can go, you know, it can span from you know a guy duct taping a banana to a wall um, versus you know someone you know filming something you know beautiful documentary or someone taking a beautiful sunset. I think it's really to the individual. And the the longer that I've work i've sort of always had this uh i'll call it a side hustle of photography and videography you know the last 10 years or so um i i can really concern myself less with how other people look at it and i and i i think i think art really is more into to me at least the creation process and whatever that results in um i don't really think that matters to be honest so i i think it's I think the art, uh, hopefully, at the end of the day, is is for the artist. Um, although, again, if you're obviously using it to make money and have a career, that you might feel a little bit differently. But I teach uh, photography to my students and to other students, um, and I, you know, I think their artwork is just as good as a lot of people that do it professionally. And it's, I think it's, I think it's a creative process. I think it's a means to create something and to, you know express your emotions and your and what you're seeing in everyday life um, or what you're thinking uh, uh, just in your thoughts. And again, whether that's taking a, a picture or putting a pencil to paper or um, creating music, um, I think that is the, more so the creation product than the, the end result, um, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, I guess my follow-up question would be, do you feel that there's something spiritual to creating art? So not just looking at art, but the actual creativity part of it. I think it could be. I think there, I mean, again, you, you could certainly make that analogy. Um, uh, I think that for, um, I guess even for myself, just when I'm going out and creating, if I'm, you know, having a, a difficult time um, or, you know, whatever the case may be, and just going out and um, spending a couple hours in the city, just observing people and street scenes and taking, you know, photographs or, um, if I want to go out and meet people and interview them, um, I think those are, you know, I think in a way those are sort of spiritual because they are um, sort of bringing, you know, bringing some sort of peace really to me, um, um, or at least some sort of centering point. Um, so I think artists can, um, you know, use art as a spiritual medium as well. Um, and I think it all depends on the individual, but I, I definitely, for my own experience, at least could see that it would be sort of a spiritual process. That's cool. Um, and so I'm, I'm asking these questions because your answers are very clear, but it's also very clear to me that you're like extremely open-minded in a unique way. So I want to kind of hear your responses to a lot of seemingly random questions. Cause I think for our general audience, you might actually be 
more normal than they think or we think. Um, and so, uh, especially because you're, I mean, your background, your parents were both psychologists. You talked about feelings, um, but you also took this approach to life of like, go out there and get it. You know, living in Germany is not easy. Um, I've lived abroad. It doesn't matter where you go. It's hard. Um, culture shock is a real thing. So I'm kind of curious what, um, you mentioned that you'd had a couple like very sudden interactions with death and I don't need you to give the details if they're personal or um, that's too much to ask, but can you at the very least give the details of how they affected you? Yeah. I, I mean, and I, you know, sort of in the, in the spirit of uh, my parents, uh, I, I'm comfortable sharing those things and, you know, I've come to terms with, with them. Um, but I, I think it goes back to, again, like for me, you know, you can really ruminate on death and think about it all the time, and, or you can not, you know, have a part of your thought process at all. And I think in life, um, you know, again, it sort of ebbs and flows. So, you know, you go through a few years where everything is great. You don't think about it once. And then uh, for me, uh, when I had just graduated college, I, I had an uncle who um, had, you know, sort of very abruptly and out of nowhere uh, taken his own life. And that was obviously a very sobering uh, uh, event. And it was, you know, very catastrophic for my family and for my father um, who, who lost a brother and things like that. And I think it really brought in a different thought of um, passing away that I hadn't really thought about before. I had had family members, you know, pass away from illness or old age or things like that. Um, but that that one really, you know, for, for a while probably got me thinking a lot about, you know, uh, death. And, and it's one of those things where, you know, I've always been the mindset like you sort of live your life and just randomly the clock ends for you but in, in his case it was sort of a choice that was made so that and that took a long time for me to come to grips with that and really kind of made me think a lot more about that and, and differently in some cases and then um i uh, over over the covid uh, process or whatever we'd call the last uh, you know year and a half i, I had a, a really close friend that i grew up with uh, all passed suddenly from covid as well so um, one of those things where, yeah, so, I mean, it's one of those things where, again, I say, like, every, it could be a year, could be a couple months, could be five years, whatever. I think it's, you know, one of those things where it's maybe a thing, something that you don't think a lot about, or maybe it's sort of in the very back of your mind, but then you have these life events uh, that sort of happen and, and really put things into perspective for you. So th those events have always sort of kind of brought me back into it, and because, Maybe they were a little bit more impactful. I think that, you know, I think I mentioned it before, but it sort of stays in my thought flow or process because it helps me just make those decisions uh, as I'm, you know, living my life. So if there are opportunities that I want to take or things that I want to do, I usually encourage myself to do it um, because it's, you know, life is a very kind of brief thing in first for some people. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that was touching. Thank you. I, um, yeah, I, I want to say like I'm sorry for your loss, but it's it's beyond that at this point. So um, yeah, that's that's rough though, and uh, I like that you take death repeatedly over and over again and try to make it so that your life feels more meaningful and that you make changes. And I'm also impressed by your decision on the subway that one day. So with that said, I kind of got a couple wrap up questions for you. Um, the first one, because you're an international man of mystery, um, what would be something from a different culture that you wish we adopted here in America? So um, I guess this sort of goes into, uh, you know, I, I, I do visual work on the side with photography and, and videography in the last uh, three years or so, I've been working on this documentary film in Iceland um, and um, we haven't been able to go over to finish it because of COVID, but um, I've, uh, been over there quite a bit and spent a lot of time in life in the last three years. And the gentleman that we're sort of doing this documentary on um, was a, uh, you know, punk rock atheist, like very anti-establishment guy. Uh, and so he had his own kind of life changing experience. And, um, you know, he has this saying where it's sort of, um, I don't want, it's sort of akin to case or sort of, but just like, you know, It'll it'll work out in the end. I, I forget the actual Icelandic uh, terminology. I'm sure I'd butcher it if I knew how to say it. But um, I think their approach to life, which is um, sort of be be true to yourself and be who you are, and it'll it'll work out one way or the other, is uh, something that I've really been uh, sort of impacted by probably since I've been traveling there and. and heard it from this gentleman, but also really have just seen it with the, with the way people kind of lead their lives over there. So it's uh, it's kind of a very 
um, I would say, uh, welcome simplicity that maybe here we don't always have because we're, you know, we've got a million things on our plates and we're going, you know, from one place to the next. And uh, it's refreshing in a way. Cool. Very cool. And this question might be more difficult to answer, so don't feel any pressure. Uh, America exports its culture to an insane degree, but is there something you think that in your travels, other cultures could actually take from us that would help them out? And again, I'm asking this in a very like un uh, assimilation or, you know what I mean? There's a lot of BS uh, out there of accusations about uh, cultural appropriation. So this question's clean. I'm just curious if you think that there's something here. Yeah. It is, that's a great question, actually, and uh, it's 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 super loaded. And I think that at different stages of my different stages of my life, I probably would have answered it uh, in a different way. Um, and you know, I definitely don't want to come across as like cynical or things like that. But I don't. I'm trying to pinpoint one thing that I would say we should export. You know, not I, you know, without getting too far down the rabbit hole, I'm not filled with a lot of things that we're that we're doing um, <laughs> that we're that we have done in the in the last few years, but. I do think there's this sense of, you know, it's a step below, like, um, you know, saying that like we should have everything. But I, I do think there's this sort of, I don't know, like I would say, like American spirit of like I should have be able to at least have the opportunities to go get opportunities. Now, you know, I would disagree that everybody has those that ability to get those opportunities in this country. But again, that's another conversation. But I think just that mentality that like. I should, you know, if I want to go out and do something, I should be able to do that um, because I think in, I see it a lot just even in my teaching because I, I teach students from all over the world. I think there's, in some cultures, there's very set ways of where it's still, you know, there's a lot of very rigid expectations and structure. And um, I think that's what I really like about teaching too, is that these students who maybe have come from a very formal or civilized, um, or not civilized, but a very formal or structured school system in China, for example, can come over here and, you know, what you like or don't like about the American school system is that at least they're like thinking for themselves for a change and they're doing these things that like maybe wouldn't have been appropriate or chastised back uh, in, in their in their previous country. So I think maybe that, I guess I would, I don't know if American spirit is the way to coin it, but there's sort of this like, and again, attitude makes it sound bad, but like, I think just that idea that like, if you want something like you should at least have the opportunity to try and go get it. And not that you should have everything, but like you should have this ability to at least, you know, go and exercise that ability to try and get something. That's funny. You made me think of something like there's a cliche phrase, shoot for the stars, but no one says like every star is yours and you own it and deserve it. So yeah, that line between aiming for great things for yourself, but not demanding it and then selfishly hoarding it. So yeah, dude, I... I love your attitude. I'm uh, very, very up on Joshua James and his philosophy. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, I do want to give you uh, uh, the last uh, little bit of the floor here. So if there's anything you just want to say to the internet, uh, now is your time. Um, I think just, you know, go out, go out and enjoy your life. And I think uh, just, you know, try not to second guess yourself. And, um, you know, again, life is a, is a very finite thing. And, um, it's, you know, all these things are very cliche that I'm saying, but I, I think that, um, you know, every every day is this new chapter that uh, people should, you know, make some sort of experience about it, even if it's just, you know, have a hopping on the subway to go to work. Like there's there's an experience there. There's a story there and sort of value those little moments. Um, and uh, I think life becomes better at that point. So it's something that I try to do every day if I'm just, again, in my routine of going to work, like looking for those things that make it kind of an interesting day. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Joshua James, originally from Buffalo and now in New York City. You have helped us put another nail in the coffin, and we are very appreciative. Again, to our listeners, uh, if you want to help us out, please subscribe to the podcast and maybe share it with a friend or two. And of course, if you want to hear more about Joshua and to follow him, the links to his uh, socials will be in the bio. And uh, we want to thank everyone for listening. This has been another episode of Coffin Talk, Interviews with the Living. I'm Mike Oppenheim, and we will see you soon. Walk into you and I see that you see me and I see you hear this too and I feel that you need